Okay, we have 18 people now with us. Thank you for joining us. My name is Elaine. And uh, uh, you'll see Jack Barnett on the screen and Michelle Sands on the screen. And on the phone, we have Kathy Dodge. So all of our presenters are here, more or less. Welcome, Be glad, we are glad you came. Please hold your questions for after all the presenters are Oh, I'm finished. Um, you can use the Q&A. That'll go directly to Jack. And I'll be watching the chat for questions <coughs> after the presentations are completed. Please note that this uh, webinar is being recorded. And I expect to post it to YouTube by Sunday, maybe even Saturday. And you will get an email with that link. Um, that's about it. The live transcript is active if you want to see that or you can turn it off. And I think we're ready to start, Michelle. Well, um, I want to make clear that neither of the two organizations today, SEEDS uh, nor uh, Energy Clean Energy Co-op are Quaker organizations. What I'm going to talk about is my participation um, was consciously Quaker. And it's something I really haven't talked about very much before, but I wanna talk about it. And so here I am, 77, and I can do what I want. Um, and key to the, my Quaker intentions on this are two of the Quaker testimonies. The first being the Quaker peace testimony. And the Quaker peace testimony is more than um, nonviolence and conscientious objection, which are very important parts of it. But George Fox said that we should live in the power that takes away the occasion of all wars. We should live in the power that takes away the occasion of all wars. And at uh, for a long time, I didn't know what it meant to live in the power. But in the two, early 2000s, I had a pretty good idea of what the occasion of all wars was. Um, my son-in-law was stationed in Taji outside of Baghdad, and that was clearly a war for access to energy. And my great-great-grandparents came here from the Saar region uh, which is sometimes France, sometimes Germany, because they were always fighting over the, uh, the coal. And my grandchildren, their great-great-grandparents were enslaved to forcibly provide free energy. So the energy wars were pretty important to me. But then when the fracking campaign came to Northeast Pennsylvania, it brought it even closer to home. Leasing companies wanted to drill underneath our farmland and all of our neighbors, we were surrounded on four sides by uh, people who had decided to lease their land. There were a lot of angry, threatening people. I remember I got one call, anonymous call at night that I was gonna lose all of my friends, every one of them, everyone in Sullivan County and Wayne County as well. But um, if we refused to lease our land, uh, our neighbors would be mad. And then as this anonymous caller called, a lot of my friends would be mad if we did. But leasing would not fit well with the other Quaker testimony, which is so important to me, and that is the stewardship testimony that we are to care for the earth. And that would not work with leasing. So there had to be another way. And I, I took it to my Quaker meeting. And the Quaker meeting met in Journey's End Farm. And Journey's End Farm um, in Wayne County uh, for generations has used sustainable agriculture 
and sustainable energy practices for generations. And in, indeed, at that time, it was still powered in part by Jimmy Carter's uh, solar panels. At the meeting, one of the Curtises, Ira, suggested a Quaker Clearness Committee. I'd never been to one, never had one. But briefly, a Clearness Committee is a group of Quakers who listen and question on a specific issue to support the people involved in the issue. It was led by Barbara Farley, um, who was a Quaker from Susquehanna uh, County nearby, and she had leased her land in Susquehanna County. Also on the committee were uh, Wally and Bev. Wally was a retired petrochemical engineer from uh, Oklahoma, and Beverly was a seasoned Quaker. And Aggie, I see she's here today, Aggie, was also part of the, of the Clearness Committee and a seasoned Quaker and um, a counselor for, uh, with lots of, lots of experience in counseling. And Ira, of course, who was about 20 at the time and had helped his dad <laughs> with much of the sustainable energy on his farm. And then my husband, Art, and myself. And it was a tough but loving and supporting long evening. What emerged was much more than a consensus. It was a conviction. It was a conviction that we must not oppose, but gather our community, both on both sides of the fracking issue, to support, build, and spread sustainable energy in Northeast Pennsylvania. With that clearness committee, I understood then what is the power, the power to, to make an end, to take away the occasion of all, of all energy. And this particularly small energy war, and yet it was an energy war that specifically affected me. So with that power, I began talking to people. First, Chuck Hine, oh, I see he's on there too. Hi, Chuck. And then Kathy Dodge, who's going to be speaking a lot. And they both have continued and built seeds. Uh, and seeds was then became sustainable energy education and development support. Uh, so they've both been through with us through the years. We began having meetings first in our front uh, in our front room and around the kitchen table. And then the Damascus Township building. And uh, I remember one of those meetings in the Damascus Township Committee or Township building was standing room only. So there were people at that meeting who'd leased their lands and people who had not. And after a while, we didn't care who was who. All, we all wanted to know about wind, solar, hydro, and plant-based energy. So we organized, uh, but we could not get anyone to come to our rural, sparsely populated area to install solar panels. We figured it would cost close to $10,000 to send one electrician or contractor to the main solar installation um, organization in Colorado. So Kathy and I went to a conference in uh, near uh, Philadelphia, and one of the main speakers, Roy Butler, was the main uh, instructor at the at the training in Colorado. I think it was Colorado Sun Power, and he was also a frequent um, contributor to a sustainable energy magazine. And after he spoke, the power grabbed me. I grabbed Kathy and we went up to Roy and we asked him to come to Honesdale, Pennsylvania and teach solar installation. And he said, yes. Um, a 
fishing lodge and a case of beer were involved, but he said yes. The first, uh, first four day course for 10 people was sold out with a waiting list. And the second and the third and the fourth people came mostly contractors, not just from our area, but from Ohio, New Jersey. And in all we took, uh, trained 60 different contractors. Another issue that I needed the power, we now had all the local, uh, local installers, but we needed the, ins uh, the state incentive funding from the state for homeowners. I went to Harrisburg to a large meeting where the Secretary of Energy explained that in order to get more bang for their buck, they were gonna concentrate on Philadelphia and uh, Pittsburgh. I got a microphone power in here and uh, I said, look, we in Northeast Pennsylvania, we are also shovel ready, ready to do this. He interrupted me and said we should take this offline, but I continued. And some Lancaster uh, Mennonites joined in and eventually we got the okay and got the, the money uh, available, the incentive money available to the homeowners. Um, by 2011, our little area was third in the state per capita solar installations on par with Bucks County. Good for homeowners, but there was no incentive money and no um, support for nonprofits, churches, and I think there was another uh, area that was not covered. <laughs> so Seeds wanted to start an energy cooperative. Power called again, and we went to the vice president of the largest bank in the county. He said no. He said, do an L, uh, co energy cooperatives are much too complicated. Do an LLC, get that form, come back and we'll talk. Well, thankfully, this was about the time that Jack was retiring and he had the expertise and now the time to take on organizing an energy co-op. He put hundreds of hours into incorporation papers but we needed an energy lawyer to review it. And no one locally had that kind of experience or know-how. Happened that I knew somebody from Quaker Earth Care, but he was a big Philadelphia mainline Quaker lawyer. With some help from the power again, I got through his secretary and actually talked to him and he said, okay, uh, his firm had a big pro bono department and they would give it to them. But he warned there was a big backlog for pro bono work and it would be months. Ordinarily at this point, I would say, oh, well, thank you. Sorry, it didn't work out. But again, the powers kept me talking. And after a while, the power must have reached him too because he gave up a weekend and he went over all the work that Jack had put together and it was reviewed by one of the best energy lawyers in the, in the country. So SEEDS and Clean Energy Co-op are not Quaker organizations, but the part I played in them was certainly inspired, infused, motivated by Quaker testimonies power that I certainly didn't have as an individual. Or did I have that power all the time, or even in many situations? Someone on the board after a particularly difficult meeting said, I thought you were a Quaker. Aren't Quakers supposed to be peaceful and quiet? How can you be a Quaker? 
I think I replied, that is exactly why I'm a Quaker, because I need to be reminded of the importance of inner quiet to find the peaceful source of all the power that leads me to do my work. So now I wanna introduce Kathy. And Kathy Dodge has been the heart and the hands of SEED for so many years. You know, may know her by her work in the Audubon Society or for protecting democracy. Whatever she does is generous, honest work and Northeast Pennsylvania is blessed to have her. Kathy, even if we can't see you, let's hear you. Thank you so much for those kind words, Michelle. And I'm really happy to hear your voice again um, and to hear some of the, the parts of the beginnings of seeds that I, I really wasn't familiar with, the, the Quaker roots. Um, so this is very en uh, enlightening to me and empowering to me. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you for inviting seeds tonight. Um, as you can see, we're sustainable energy education and development support. And that means that our middle name is education. Uh, next slide, please. What I'm gonna talk about, and, and I'm, unfortunately some of this is gonna overlap with what Michelle has said, but excuse the uh, repetition. So I'll talk about what SEEDS is, a bit of our history and our accomplishments and how and why I think SEEDS has gained acceptance and has persevered and how you might benefit from our experiences. Next slide. So as, as you heard, are we okay? Yes. I just heard some noise. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, we started in Michelle Sam's living room. And as you heard, she had a thought. What were all the people in our community who might reap a windfall of money from the coming fracking boom going to do with their money? Would this be an opportunity to help them manage their newfound wealth in ways that could help our environment and quality of life? Like investing in clean energy, which will pay back in myriad ways instead of buying a swimming pool or a fancy new gas guzzling truck. So Seeds was born and I was there along with about, as I remember, 10 other people in that living room who wanted to see something positive come out of the fracking scenario. And the stars were aligned. There was a burgeoning renewable energy movement and a promise of money coming to landowners. But fast forward, fracking didn't exactly pan out as many landowners had hoped. It wasn't as rich in gas as perceived early in the game. And the pro and anti-fracking factions were polarizing our community. Seeds decided to be a neutral organization. We even decided to avoid the words climate change, although internally, we felt strongly that it needed to be addressed through our proactive stance. And we'll talk more about that later. Our concept was to build bridges, not walls, embrace the positive, promote what nearly everyone could see as good ideas and assist in implementation. So we had lots of people embrace us from all sides of the political spectrum. Next slide. Some of the first things we did were to plant, nurture and incentivize an interest in sustainable living through free public forums about energy efficiency, renewable energy, and sustainable living. We used positive messages that nearly everyone could embrace as good ideas, such as saving energy saves money. A more efficient home is more comfortable and saves money. Using non-toxic cleaning products is better for your health. Buying local food supports local jobs, our local farmers, and helps maintain our beautiful landscape and our green spaces. Next slide, which would be slide number five. Our model was to include a few knowledgeable speakers, include a few local people who have had direct expertise with the subject, either good or bad, and create a need and a desire for renewable energy and efficiency, such as this 
find it, fix it for them. It was a hands-on workshop, which had tables all around the room with people could visit different ideas on how they could make their home more efficient, like caulking and tricks and tips for the saving energy in the kitchen, et cetera. Next slide. Or a forum on cleaning products that don't threaten your health. Or food sovereignty, the right of people to healthy and culturally appropriate food produced through ecologically sound and sustainable methods, linking the pleasures of food with a commitment to community and the environment. Or edible yards, learning how to grow healthy food while becoming more self-reliant and creating biodiverse environment in your own yard and your community. And for those more planet-oriented, adding biodiversity to the world. Slide seven. Hand in hand with educating the public, we worked on establishing the infrastructure to support this new interest we were building in energy efficiency and renewable energy. Create the need, and at the same time, create the infrastructure to support the need. We held both small-scale wind and solar installation and maintenance courses for local contractors in 2009, our first full year of operation. The solar course was so popular that we scheduled three more that year. Michelle, I'm glad your, your data and mine agree. We now have local solar installers. And with the huge recent growth of solar and the drop in price of panels, additional installers have cropped up in the region. Now, Jack tells me that the price of panels are actually going up right now um, because, I guess, of the supply chain issues. In 2016, we held a series of workshops for our local building industry organization on building with solar in mind, designing and building for maximum energy efficiency and ground and air source heat pump technologies. We served dinner at each session, which helped with the great contractor attendance. Next slide. We also started a program to train local high school students to be part of our energy efficiency assessment teams. It was great intergenerational interaction. Who wouldn't love to have nice, pleasant, polite, well-educated high school students come into your house and help you with making your home more efficient. Unfortunately, COVID put this on hold, but we have just gotten a grant to reopen this program for neighboring Lackawanna County this coming summer, targeting lower income households. And we're hoping that COVID restrictions don't delay this again. Our next slide. We also have two volunteers and Jack, who will be speaking after me is one of them. And Jim Sanders is the other who give free solar assessments to SEEDS members. We help protect people from unscrupulous solar installers who will happily site panels in unsuitable places. This uh, photo is of the Solar Pathfinder, which is the tool that is used to find out whether a particular site is suitable for solar. The graph on it shows um, the whole year's worth of where the sun is, is uh, shining on the, on the dome there and you can tell which trees are in the way or what other structures are, might be in the way. Uh, so it's a really cool instrument. We now have a blog that gives updates on solar technology. Again, thanks to Jack. You're gonna hear his name a lot in here because he does so much for seeds. Our next sign, slide, number 10. We collaborated with Habitat for Humanity, encouraging them to be more energy efficiency conscious when building habitat homes, using state-of-the-art insulation and other smart materials. One result was the first solar thermal installa installation on a habitat house in Pennsylvania. We encouraged habitat to go even further. They're now building a passive house with plans donated by Richard Pedranti, a local certified passive house architect. Now I'm not talking about passive solar, which is great, inviting the sun into the home to heat it in passive ways, but going further, using intelligent architecture and building materials in advanced and highly efficient ways to make a building super efficient. Next slide. Now, Michelle Sands' wish list included a local cooperative, as you heard her say, 
um, and I loved hearing all the details about how she got that to come come through. So it was the result of her vision, a seed spinoff in 2013. Jack gets a lot of credit for making this happen, and he'll talk more about this shortly. Another, The next slide. Another way we are reaching our community is through today's main ingredient, which is a local uh, food podcast. Uh, 20 ep 27 episodes were aired this past year. And um, to encourage local food production. And we interview a local grower of a certain ingredient, a chef or other foodie from our area about how to prepare it, and a local nutritionist discussing the ingredient's nutritional benefits. Next slide. Our governance. And this is thanks to Michelle, too. She really pushed for this. We use sociocracy, or dynamic self-governance, which is a system which seeks to create an inclusive and safe environment to conduct the work of an organization. It uses consent rather than majority voting and respects all views. Because we want to build bridges, welcoming the whole community, we've been reluctant to adopt public positions on sensitive, potentially alienating topics, such as fracking and the climate crisis. But then we must ask ourselves, are we doing enough? Will we actually accomplish our goals if we do not free ourselves to talk about such topics? Next slide, please. Three of us on our board went through the sensitive topics procedure. SEEDS has established to address sensitive topics. We felt there was a need to be more out front on climate change action and presented it to the board. This is the climate statement that was consented to in July of 2020. Seeds will use science, evidence-based information, and positive action to educate the public about global climate change and will advocate for action to help our local community deal with the wide range of impacts of climate change. Next slide. Now I'm gonna get a little bit more personal. So I ask myself, is it enough? Can I do more? I have been conflicted about this. Before SEEDS existed, I was very vocal about peace and justice and the environment. So I had a certain reputation in the community. I had my share of hate mail. I was called a commie pinko and a traitor. I and my friends, including uh, Chuck Hine, who's on the on this, I think, were booed in the streets for trying to stop the invasion of Iraq. And no, this is not me on a horse trying to stop one of the pipelines. It is a very committed and brave soul doing what she sees is right and just. I think we really need people standing up for their principles like her by speaking in public or at hearings, marching in the streets, using the courts, confronting injustices, practicing civil disobedience, risking hate mail, hostility, and prison. But we also need others who will do the work in other ways. As chair of SEEDS and active in our local Audubon chapter, I felt I should stop marching in the streets and making personal public statements about my own opinions because it might hurt the organizations with which I am closely associated. I decided to use the SEEDS model, accentuate the positive, engage with people where they are while still doing my duty to contact those in power on issues and legislation. Next slide. Here's an example of another person who works kind of like seeds. It's Judy Wicks. She was our keynote, keynote speaker at our 2020 virtual annual meeting. She's an author, activist, and entrepreneur, the founder of Philadelphia's White Dog Cafe, and a pioneer in the local food movement. She gets an idea, inspires others to be on board, rolls up her sleeves, and works hard to help the idea blossom into reality. Her current focus is Altogether Now PA, which SEEDS is a member of. And its mission is to unite urban and rural communities to build resilient, self-reliant regional economies to both mitigate and prepare for climate change while increasing equality and community wealth. Next slide, which should be 17. 
This is one of my favorite pictures. This is our, one of our great volunteers, Martin Springetti. He's a graduate of one of our do-it-yourself solar workshops, which we hold every year, and he's celebrating his solar installation. I originally had Think Globally, Act Locally on this slide, but there are some people in our region of Northeast PA who have never been outside their own community, much less another country. To ask them to think globally is probably not the best strategy. And huge political polarization demands that we find common ground before we can expect our messages to gain traction throughout our community. So here is our message, which we hope is useful to you. Seek out the imagination and passion of people in your community and help them build upon it. Empower them to make positive change, dwelling on the direct benefits of action to them and their community. Accentuate the positive. Hope is a great incentive. Seeds last year, I think it was, started hashtag Seeds Good News. And these are things that are happening around the world, including our local community, which are simply good news about what's happening in the world. So we do this on our social media and in our newsletters. And we try to make them short and sweet so people will actually read them. Use power of the purse. Remember, energy efficiency saves money and climate impacts are expensive. Think about wildfires and flooding. Many people can't get home insurance because of that now. But hold our elected officials accountable to we the people. They're here to serve us, not the powerful and well-heeled corporate interests to buy their way into the halls of power. They need constant reminding of these. Many TED Talks have broached the subject of reaching people, and I gathered a few tips here. Use plain, obvious, and simple words and concepts to connect with others. Avoid messages that invite confusion and a feeling of hopelessness. Connect your issue with your audience's personal experience and anxieties. For example, talk about local flooding and its financial and social cost to them and their community. Next slide. Lots of people are doing and not doing things now in the name of their personal freedoms. Well, one might talk to such a person about freedom from the power companies by making their own power and getting the power companies to pay them for the surplus. These people might like the idea of sticking it to the man by using solar panels. And I showed these two pictures on this slide. One is our DIY uh, annual do-it-yourself solar workshop um, where people learn how to put up their own solar panels and seeds volunteers often come along to help them because Doing it yourself is, is great, but trying to get panels up onto a roof with one person is pretty hard. The other picture is of the local Highlights Foundation uh, from Highlights for Children magazine. They have a foundation. This is an installation that we put up this summer. Uh, Seeds volunteers helped them put it up, and Jack, I know, did a lot of the engineering work behind that, too. See, I told you you'd hear more about Jack. Uh, next slide. I just listed some resources here. Uh, I spoke at two Unitarian Universalist congregations recently, and my research found a number of UU resources whose philosophy seemed to me to be very similar to what the Friends have. So I kept them in here along with some Friends resources that you probably know much more about than I do, but I list them just in case. There are so many organizations working on the climate crisis. I list a few more in the next slide. These, some of these are specifically for younger people, which I think is terribly important now because younger people feel very strongly about the climate and we need to give them ways to support their efforts and we need to support them as well. And the next slide, this is... Um, more renewable energy organizations. Now, you don't have to copy all this down because this will be recorded, so you can come back to these links later. And this is another opportunity. Uh, there's going to be a national conversation in April of 2022. Um, 
This symposium is going, the, the purpose of this venture is to spark a national conversation amongst activist movements to address some of the underlying factors that are confronting, uh, or, or that are contributing to issues that we are facing. And so with that, I say thank you for having me and listening to me. And I'm sorry I had to be on the phone, but we were having uh, connection issues tonight, which scared me. But we figured out how to do it by phone, and I hope you heard me well. And we won't take questions now, but I do show here some of our sponsors because we thank them very much for supporting what Seeds does. So thank you. And now I'm going to uh, introduce Jack. And you've heard a lot about him in what I was talking about. He is he is so valuable to Seeds, and I'm so grateful to have him on our board and and uh, in our energy circle. And he just does so much. It's just amazing what he accomplishes. Um, and so, and the fact that he did the Clean Energy Co-op uh, under Michelle's, uh, uh, I can't think of the word, uh, Encouragement. So, inspiration. Jack, I'm going to turn it over to you. Inspiration. That's the right. That's the word. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, Michelle. <laughs> really appreciate the, all the comments. But it is a team sport, and we definitely have a great team here in the Northeast and Honesteel area. Um, so, I, uh, Elaine, are you going to share my slides, or would you like me to? Okay, I've got great. It. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, Michelle had, and her story of how the seeds and the co-op were created are real important and real valuable. Um, I, I'm an engineer. I worked in the telecom industry for nearly 30 years and was able to retire in 2013. And that was a... Uh, a wonderful feeling of, of being able to give up a job that drove me uh, to travel around the world and do a lot of crazy things, um, hard things, hard work, well paid, but I didn't need to do that anymore. Um, and it was definitely a mental health improvement to become retired and then able to commit myself to things that motivated me and, and do the things that I thought were, would improve the community that we've committed to live in and the world. So we were, um, Marianne's my wife, Marianne Carletta, uh, she, her mother grew up in Honesdale and we were able to decide early on in our marriage that we wanted to live in Wayne County and retire there. So we were able to buy some property and, and create a home that we lived in seasonally and then are able to be full-time as of 2015. And our co-op started just as, as Michelle mentioned, about the same time I retired in 2013. Um, and it was started as a, as a circle within the uh, SEEDS governance where we, and particularly driven by Michelle's vision, wanted to do more than we could do as a nonprofit. SEEDS is a 501c3. Nonprofit can't apply to several of the federal grant programs that supported solar. So we needed a, a for-profit entity, with, but still with a very committed mission. So we um, were able to incorporate the, the entity and spin off independently from SEEDS in May of 2014. And we chose a cooperative cooperation um, because of many reasons, um, mostly, as we'll talk about in a minute, the seven cooperative principles. But also, there are benefits, and the energy lawyer that Michelle mentioned were one of the first to tell us of the benefits of being registered as a cooperative corporation. It allows us to raise funds from our membership in a way that would normally in a non-cooperative uh, not be allowed by the S Securities and Exchange Commission. So it's an important benefit for being a cooperative registered in Pennsylvania. And last year, we had a wonderful experience. Um, one of the things I've done all along is help 
other groups who contact me or any of the members of the co-op on how we did it and what they could do to, to repeat the same thing in other places, whether outside of Pennsylvania or within Pennsylvania. And in 2020, a group in Havertown, a suburb of Philly, contacted us and said, here's how we've financed solar. Let's help you get to do it yourself. And they turned around and said, why? Why don't we just join your co-op? Um, and it was a great experience. We, we had this good conversation with all our cooperative members on changing our bylaws to allow for chapters to be created and to be semi-independent, but still part of the overall cooperative and share knowledge, share expertise, share, share um, accounting and uh, legal costs and other things to do the projects. And so we are excited that in uh, the last 12 months, we've had over 40 new members join our cooperative from the uh, Southeast Pennsylvania area, and they are anxiously proceeding toward their first project. And I'll talk a little bit more. Next slide. Um, one of the things we changed from our original mission that Kathy showed is when we talked about our bylaws and to allow for a for um, multiple chapters, the only change we changed in the mission was to substitute a plural for communities, uh, or for what was previously community in the middle of this. So to sustainably develop renewable energy resources for a healthy and just energy future for our communities using local investment and providing positive returns to its members. And I'll just note that its members is somewhat ambiguous and intentionally. We don't mean just the members of the cooperative. We also mean the members of the community. Next slide. I mentioned the seven cooperative principles and these are recognized principles of cooperative entities since the 1850s, 1840s actually, um, when the first recognized modern cooperative was uh, structured in England. And for us, it's very important that we have uh, voluntary and open membership, democratic control of the organization through elections, all the members are economic participants. Um, our membership is a one-time $100 um, purchase of a common share in our corporation. And then they have one vote and all members have that same one vote, even if they also invest in our projects and have our non-voting preferred shares. As a cooperative, we will be independent and autonomous from other organizations, so we can't be owned by a parent organization. Uh, we have portions of our efforts put forward to education, training, and other information sharing. And we cooperate with other cooperatives and have a concern for our communities. Those are the principles that we are guided by. I will also mention that we inherited from SEEDS the sociocracy model. So we run our board meeting by consent, not by majority vote. Next slide. So why the Clean Energy Cooperative? In my mind, it's always been about community, ownership, and governance. Those three themes are important to us at every turn. We are entirely volunteer run. We have no paid staff. Um, so, and like a credit union or an investment club, only the members can be investors. Um, and we kind of have a process about learning first, learning about what we do and how we do it. Join the cooperative. We encourage everyone to, to join. Many of you on this call are already members and thank you. And please continue to participate. Once you're joined, you can invest. And uh, we will talk a little bit more in the next slide about how you invest. 
And then those people who have invested in our projects are able to earn a modest return. Uh, we've been successful since the first project completed at paying a 2% annual dividend on the investors' inv uh, money. Next slide. How do we work? We're, we're pretty much like an investment club at, at a, it's maybe a slightly larger scale than most. Our co-op board um, is the reviewing entity, but we have a project development committee that evaluates candidate projects proposed by any member of the co-op and puts together a, a business plan basically for that project. And the idea is, A, the project needs to align with our mission, fundamental requirement. It also needs to understand its risks and what funds it needs to can be constructed and operate it over time. And the idea is it will operate and generate recurring revenues that will cover those operating costs plus be able to repay all the initial capital and a modest return over the long term. So it's a slow money business model. And I'd be glad to talk about slow money some other time. Um, slow money is another theme and entity uh, movement nationally and internationally that's important to me. And so this is kind of has a nice overlap. Next slide. So our co-op was able to complete the first of its projects in 2015. And that's the picture on the left. That's the um, roof of the nonprofit Cooperage that is based on Main Street in Homesdale. It actually is a former Cooper who built the building in the 1800s, building barrels or the cardboard boxes of the day that shipped everything and, and everything across the country from Honesteel. That system plus the next two are, are th that's a nonprofit. So the co-op co actually owns that array directly. It's part of, we have the title to that array. It's, it's on the roof of the nonprofit building, however. And the main reason there is nonprofits, as Michelle mentioned, are not eligible for the federal tax incentives that are available from the federal government. There are no longer any Pennsylvania tax incentives. And that's something I'd love to see change in Harrisburg, but that's a different battle. Um, so by being a for-profit entity, the co-op could get the depreciation and tax credit and use them while selling all the energy that's produced directly to the nonprofit that operates the building. The other two, the next two projects we did are two organic certified farms in Wayne County, the Ant Hill Farm and the Will-O-Wisp Organic Farm. Those cases were also, you know, are community-based organizations, but they are for-profit. So in that case, they could get the benefits of the tax incentives, and instead we offered them a low interest long-term loan so that they could actually have lower payments to the co-op for the monthly principal and interest on the loan than they had previously been paying in their utility bills. So for them, it was an immediately cash benefit to switch to paying the loan to the co-op than paying the utility. And the most recent project was another example of a nonprofit that can't take advantage of the federal tax incentives, which is government owned buildings. So this building on the right is the Storebridge project, which is a former elementary school in downtown Honesdale, uh, built in 1928, and is now operated by the Wayne County government as a innovation center. In fact, the next slide will refer to it. But let me say, we are very pleased that we've been recognized for these projects, both nationally and locally. In 2016, the Inter Interstate Renewable Energy Council, 
awarded our Storbridge, our, our Cooperage Project Award, the best community renewable energy project nationally. And I was invited, I was president of the co-op at that time. I was invited to go to Las Vegas to receive the award. Unfortunately, I didn't make it. Um, but we still proudly show it off in the lobby of the Cooperage. And last year, we received the Pennsylvania Environmental Council Environmental Partnership Award for the Storebridge Project Array. And that was recognized as a public-private partnership where our Wayne County commissioners, very conservative group of people, um, wanted solar on the roof of their building because it's an innovation center, maker space, and really focused on enabling new technologies to be good employers in the county. So it was a perfectly aligned mission. Next slide. That project um, was based on a 25 year fixed price, what's known as a power purchase agreement or more commonly you might know of it as a solar lease. And this is the same arrangement we had with the nonprofit at the Cooperage. But in this case, we went one step further. We also created a subsidiary LLC, very much like Michelle mentioned with the bank told her at the very beginning, we do need sometimes to have a subsidiary LLC so that we can maximally leverage those federal tax incentives. Because we're still carrying on the books our books, the federal tax credit from the cooperage and are only being able to use a very small portion of it to date. Fortunately, it can carry forward to, for 20 years. So we've got another 15 still to go. Um, anyway, we were able to um, set aside some of the unneeded contingency funds for the construction and use those to fund an educational display and it's really a piece of art. Um, Lisa Grover, who's the resident maker in the Storebridge project, did the work. Um, it's um, laser cut and etched woodwork of many several, several different woods with these beautiful um, engraved metal um, plaques and glass panels uh, that educates the people who come into that lobby about solar energy and its local as well as global impacts. And for this, we were able also named the Wayne County Innovator, Business Innovator of the Year in 2020. So these are great innovations from very conservative organizations, recognition from these conservative organizations. So again, as Seeds and Michelle all both said, Kathy said too, emphasize the positive and build bridges. We are trying to do that very much so. Next slide, please. Um, if anybody's interested, I could go into more details of how the funding was raised, but basically each project, we are selling our preferred shares, non-voting shares to only co-op members who are also Pennsylvania legal residents. Those are the constraints um, that otherwise we would not be able to, to, to do um, securities offering because this is a security. Um, to, and, and we can't do it in public. We can only share the information directly to these limited set of, of, of individuals when we have a prospectus. Um, but we've been able to raise um, well over $200,000 from our members. And then by recycling the revenues we receive from the prior projects into later projects. So up to date, we, we've actually sold up to 210 preferred shares to 42 different members of the cooperative. Thank you all. Um, we have actually already repurchased um, seven of those shares back to repay those investors who wish to get out. We had voluntary redemption offered both last year and this year. 
um, I'm sorry, in 2020 and 2021. And the board has already approved one for 2022, but we haven't yet sent out the letter. That'll be coming in the next week or so. And dividends have been paid in every year since the project and the board just authorized the 2022 dividend as well at 2%. So a modest but visible return, better than a checking account for sure and most CDs. <laughs> next slide, please. 20 bucks. The 2%. Basic model is, it's a triple bottom line. People, profit, and planet. We really believe in our communities and the societal benefit by doing focus on clean energy. And solar is the easiest one for us to do that with. It has a very predictable revenue stream and almost no maintenance or operation cost after the construction. It has clear environmental benefits and sustainable, both from reduced uh, pollution emissions and greenhouse gas emissions. And it's a socially responsible investing model that you can see the results of in your community by looking at the array, talking about it, promoting it, et cetera. We're, we're happy to do that. And next slide. Right, so the, the we're working on projects for 2022. Um, we've got quite a candidate list for this year. We were disappointed we didn't get any to the finish line in 2021, but um, we're excited both to be working them in the Northeast and the Southeast portions of Pennsylvania. Um, our Southeast chapter is actually now over 35 members. Um, they have done a bunch of work, including working with um, two college classes to produce a guide to Pennsylvania owner, uh, Pennsylvania residents to go solar, both residents, nonprofits, and business owners. That's available on our webpage. It's really a short set of helpful hints for how to get your system installed, financed, et cetera, in whichever case you fall. Um, and their candidate project is very exciting. We've had that they've had, I should say, several meetings, both public and private, with the Haverford Township School District, where um, that school district has just opened this, this past year a new elementary school, Linwood Elementary, and its roof is beautiful, set up for solar, and could host a 200 kilowatt array, potentially, which would be larger than the sum of the four projects we've done so far really a step up in our scale efforts. And we're excited to work that. Um, so let me stop there. Please consider joining the co-op. If you in the area, please consider joining SEEDS. I'm honored and fortunate to serve on both boards. Sometimes I have to be a little careful and keeping my hats um, distinct and to avoid conflicts of interest, but they're both, um, very strong and empowering organizations that I enjoy working with and all the people who serve and volunteer on both organizations are wonderful folks to work with. And I should mention um, in 2020, I stepped down as the president of the co-op. Chris Wiegand could not be with us tonight. She was originally gonna do this speech, this presentation jointly with me. She unfortunately had a, a cross-country skiing accident and, and is not feeling well. She's, she's on the mend, but it's not perfect. Anyway, thank you all. Hey, uh, thank you to all of our presenters. Uh, Jack, there are a couple questions in the Q&A. Can you see those? Yes, I will start with Jacqueline's. Do you know about the third act? Bill McKimmon's new organization to influence big banks and change investing. Yes, I haven't, I'm not up to speed about it, but I did see the announcement and a short video that he did. So I look forward to learning more about it. That's for sure. And David asked, do we have a relationship with the energy cooperative in Philly? We talked to them early on and had a great initial conversation. Um, and in fact, they were gonna purchase 
the solar renewable energy credits from the Cooperage project when we, uh, before it was built, that was the plan. Um, and in the end, they decided not to do that. They said it was too administratively complex. And so we've had some ongoing back and forth over the years, and we certainly work hard to clarify the difference between the Clean Energy Co-op and its Southeast chapter and the Energy Cooperative. I mean, both are doing good, good deeds and we want to encourage people in the Philly region to support both cooperatives. How long does a lifetime, how, how much of a life does a solar array have? A good question, a technical one, right up my alley. Um, solar panels are warranted by their manufacturers or at least most of them, the ones that are manufactured by any um, good, trustworthy manufacturer for at least 25 years these days. Some are now coming out with 30 year warranties. So, and, and there are still panels from the 1970s that are still operating. So it really is a sustainable, renewable source in that the panel is generating more energy than its inputs required to construct it within, uh, usually within seven years. <clears throat> and that is getting even more so with the um, improvement in efficiency. So the panels in the 70s were not nearly as efficient as the panels today. These panels behind me are the, that's the roof of the Storbridge project in Honesdale with the hospital, Wing Memorial Hospital back there in the background. These panels are extra large and are nearly 20% uh, efficient. So all the 20% of the sunlight that touches, that reaches them is converted to electricity. Um, the theoretical maximum is 30%. We'll see. Maybe there are some local, there are some discussions at the National Renewable Energy Lab of maybe that 30% limit wasn't quite as limiting as originally predicted. Jack, I do have a question. How, is there anything that stops uh, local places like the courthouse and the post office, uh, township buildings? What stands between them and solar? Is it something they can do if they want to? Well, the post office is a federal government building. So I don't know what restrictions or constraints there would operate under. Um, I just have no experience with that. Um, township buildings are really, the, it's politics of getting the governing body of the entity, whether it's a school board or the township uh, supervisors, et cetera, to commit to it. Um, there is still, it's not a slam dunk around making it a cash flow positive transaction from day one. Um, I will say uh, that it's unfortunate, but P PPL raised their prices for electricity in December um, almost 35% for a commercial meter and 20, more than 25% for residential meters. So that new price from PPL actually made this storage project cash flow positive. So the commissioners are paying a lower price to the co-op for energy than they would have been paying to PPL. Um, that's not gonna always be true just because the costs of installing the system, covering the operating costs for 25 years, and then paying back all our investors with that modest income, that dividend, doesn't always translate to a fixed price that's lower than the current retail price. Um, but it's fixed. And so that's one of the reasons the county commissioners decided to go with our power purchase agreement because they knew inflation, if nothing else, would quickly drive the price higher in the regular market where our price is fixed for 25 years. No inflation, no in fact, no acceleration, accelerator, things like that. Hey. 
uh, let's see. Other questions here, here is, does snow affect solar panel efficiency? So snow prevents sunlight from reaching the solar cells. So I don't think it changes the efficiency per se. Again, I'm being an engineer on technical details. Doesn't change the efficiency, but it definitely changes the amount of sunlight that can reach the cells. Um, last year, this system here was just installed in, De in December of the prior year. And on February 1st, Honesdale had about 30 inches of snow that weekend. And it didn't melt off until four weeks later. So for the entire month of February, both this array and the Cooperage array were buried in 30 inches of snow and ice. And it didn't go anywhere. So exactly zero kilowatt hours were produced in February. And we got no re revenues for February 2021. Uh, okay, now here's another question from Lynn Graham. What about the newest innovation in the New York Times article? I think it improved the capture of solar energy per square foot. I don't know if I saw that one, so no, I'd I love it if you could send it to me. Lynn, if you could put a link in the chat or in the Q&A, we could look at that. In the meantime, I do have a question. We've had these windmills over in Waymark waving for years and years. Is that coming to Wayne County? Is that less efficient or as efficient as solar? I don't know if I can, I don't know how to compare efficiencies, um, at least not on an engineering level. And I don't have the data to do it on a financial basis. Um, the windmills, originally constructed by Flower Powered and Light, but they've sold it, I think, more than once since it was constructed. Um, so I'm not sure what the title of the entity that owns them currently is, and I don't know where they're selling the electricity. So that's a wholesale producer of electricity. And so they're selling their electricity either through a private transaction or on the wholesale market that is operated by the local, not the local, the regional grid operator. PJM is the regional grid operator for 14 states. Um, so they're getting a wholesale price for their product unless they found, found a private buyer, which they may have. Um, and I don't know what that is. Uh, in our case, all of our projects have been net metered uh, solar projects. So the, it's a different um, basis for comparison. It's really two different, very different regulatory environments and markets. <laughs> Kristen asks a good question. Um, solar panels installed on a less flat surface to be able to shed snow. Yep. It's a good one. So um, the steeper the, the, the tilt of the panel, the more likely they will um, shed the snow. And that's really important. It is a glass um, on top of the solar cells. And the, the, my roof, they're mounted at a 45 degree angle. So it sheds a lot more easily. On a flat roof, these panels are mounted on a on baskets, I guess, your fiberglass racking that does put them up at 10 degrees. But as you can probably see over here somewhere, um, there's a parapet around the roof. And that parapet uh, basically makes a nice 30 inch high snow capture zone. It loves to just pile up on the roof and the heating system doesn't melt it very quickly. That's a good thing. That's good insulation when it doesn't melt. Kathy, did you have something you wanted to add? No. Okay. I just thought you've been pretty quiet. We can give you the opportunity here. Oh, I'll, I'll speak up if I see the need. Okay. I think, I think well, Jack's doing a super job of answering these questions. 
the technical space is my my expertise, um, and that's why I'm wonderfully happy to have uh, Chris and other members of our board. Uh, Chuck is a member, and he, in fact, he's the vice president of the co-op and has been since the beginning. I should say Michelle was our first secretary and did a fabulous job of getting us eligible to to file for that grant that paid 25% of the cooperage array. And we've been able to maintain that registration ever since, Michelle. I know how hard it was to create it the first time. Do you have any advice, either Jack or Kathy, for uh, small communities that would like to start something like the Seeds Project or uh, get in touch with you uh, about the co-op? Well, um, yeah, on, on the seeds part, um, we'd be very happy to help anybody who wants to uh, set up something on, on the model that we have. Um, all they need to do is contact us and uh, we'll do whatever we can to help them do it because I think it's, it's a great model. And for the co-op, uh, yes, we're glad to do the same. Um, our website is is on the bottom of all my slides. It's cleanenergy.coop. So not com, but co-op, C-O-O-P. And all our governance legal documents are posted on that website. So you can see them. Um, I can share uh, Word versions of them if anybody's interested. And we have a process now of also how to establish new chapters of our co-op anywhere in Pennsylvania. So we'd be excited to talk to anybody who'd like to do that. We just had a first meeting with a group of individuals in the Southwest portion of the state, um, South of Pittsburgh. And we actually have several members in the Pittsburgh region already. Um, so we might come along and have a chapter in that region the Pen of Pennsylvania in the next, who knows, we'll see. I think we've addressed all of the, oh, there's one more in chat. Um, Citizen Power Inc. in Pittsburgh. Are they, all right, good. I, I j actually just read up on them. Um, it sounds like a great organization who's done, wow, amazing amounts of work over the last 20 plus years. Um, and I'll also mention this PA Solar Center, which is also based in Pittsburgh. Uh, but trying to be statewide in its programs. Um, both great organizations. Um, let's see, here's another question from Jacqueline. If not, if you're not in Northeast or Southeast, does it make sense to become a member of the co-op? Do you think we'll have a chapter in Central PA? I love that idea. Um, it's certainly possible. And yes, I think it's still valuable to be a member even outside of Pennsylvania. Um, we appreciate your input on projects or ideas on commitment to community. Just because of the way we're incorporated, um, we can't easily do projects outside of Pennsylvania, um, or at least not until we step up to a whole nother scale of legal commitments and lawyers. Um, and Jack, just to clarify, anybody can be a member as in that $100 membership, but only people in Pennsylvania can actually be investors. Right. Yes, okay. And there's another question by Lynn. What are you earning by selling solar generated credits? We're getting $350. Great. Um, it depends on how much you produce about how much the solar renewable energy credits are um, you get. They are in Pennsylvania, it's one of the last programs to support solar and it's not looking good for the future personally as, as far as I can tell, because as of June of 2021, the state completed its efforts to reach its target of one half of 1% solar energy on the retail sales. 
So that means um, there are no longer market demands to purchase the solar renewable credits. Um, so up to now, in the last, since, since 2018, when they closed the borders, um, which I won't go into, but it basically means only solar systems within the Pennsylvania state borders are eligible to receive new credits and sell them. Um, the price has been in the 25 to $35 range per credit, whereas one credit is one megawatt hour produced by the solar system. Um, I expect that price to fall within the next 12 months pretty radically um, because there's no further purchasers to appear in the marketplace and supply is continuing to increase. So I would expect the price to fall if, if Economics 101 taught me the right things. I'd most like to add something here. Uh, some of us who have solar have elected not to sell our energy credits or even, you know, have them. I even apply for them because we don't want someone else to have the excuse that they can keep polluting uh, thanks to our energy credits. So some of us just don't even do it. All right. I don't see anything more in the chat. Have we addressed everything in the Q&A? Oh, okay. Yep. There's one other comment by Lynn. Um, soul systems in DST are still paying 350. Yes. If you were uh, grandfathered um, and able to sell your credits to a under contract prior to the closing, um, and I forget when DC closed their market to outsiders, but it was sometime in like 2015 or something around there. Yeah. You can still, if you were contracted before the close, you can still get old. So that's great that you're getting good pay, good receipt for your credits. Oh, that's good point, Lynn. Um, she says she gives the dollars to environmental groups. I should mention, I just found in Philadelphia, um, I think it's the Energy Authority or, or one of the nonprofits they've sponsored. I can't remember the name, I can find it. But it, instead, if you wish to register your solar system uh, for the solar renewable energy credits, you can donate the credits directly to this nonprofit in Philadelphia who will use the money to train um, new young people to work in the solar industry and promote solar for low-income families in Philadelphia area. Uh, unfortunately, I closed that tab. I had it open for weeks, and I, now I don't have it <laughs> anymore in my, I have to go back and find it in my history. Any other questions or, or suggestions? I can tell you this has been a wonderful evening. I've loved talking to all of you and and uh, thank you for your great conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, and to all who participated with questions, if you do have follow-up questions, don't hesitate to get in touch with me or Jack or uh, Seeds. They're uh, listed, they're uh, on the internet, they have their own sites and they're also on Facebook. I'm sure they're someplace else. And I'm sure we'll all do as much as we can to get you going this direction. Thank you for the time, good night. <laughs>